recorded. You guys want to get your Bibles out. Um, this is a Bible study, right? God's warriors, um, being warriors for God, disciples of Christ. So we're going to use this, the Bible, as our sword, right? To fight off the Satan and the demons and anything bad in this world. Um, stress, worry, anxiety, depression, insecurities, doubts, fears, anything like that. This is your sword, right? Uh, lust, greed, selfishness. This is your sword to fight against this stuff, right? We got the Holy Bible. Holy means to be separated apart in a good way, holy and righteous. So, um, and warriors of God is the application. We want to take this word. We want to make sure that we're applying it in our daily lives to to serve God and his kingdom to be servants um and to be warriors for God and 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 uh in a good way a peaceful warrior a warrior for Christ a disciple for Christ so that being said guys let's uh open up the bible to John 4 um i titled this one a living water um because of one of the things that happens in this scripture um so let me know. Daniel, are you at, are you there? Brian, are you there? Are you able to pull up your Bible? I actually left my Bible at home, but I'm, I'm actually at the office right now. Cool. Well, if you can, you uh, pull up, uh, pull it up on your Bible app if you can. If you have the Bible app, highly recommend it. All right. Cool. All right. Let's, uh, let's get into it. <clears throat> um, John 4, Jesus walks with a Samaritan woman, all right? And Jesus with a Samaritan woman, which is like no bueno in that culture at the time. You'll see that. So starting, <clears throat> starting at verse 1, chapter 4, John chapter 4, verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining uh, that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Whoa. More disciples, more baptisms than John the Baptist? What's going on here? The Pharisees be like, whoa, what's going on here? All right. Verse 2. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. Okay, so it wasn't Jesus baptizing, it was his disciples doing it. Um, so he left, um, so he left Judah and went back uh once more to Galilee. Verse 4. Now he had uh, to go to uh, Samarina, uh, go through Samarina, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, verse 5. So he came to a town called Samarina, called Shai, Shaichar, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, near, the, near the plot of the ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Verse 6, Jacob well was there, and Jesus tried as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, it was about noon. Verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? He's like, Hey, give me some water. Give me a drink here. Verse 8. His disciple had gone into the town to buy food. So he's alone. He asks her, Will you give me a drink? Verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans, right? So there, this is weird, right? Who is this Jesus dude <laughs> talking to the Samaritan woman? She's like, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. What you doing here? Why are you talking to me, right? Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Hint the name of this what I, I what I titled this uh, this Bible study, Living Water. Let's re re read that again. If you knew, this is Jesus, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, what I believe that means is he's asking her for water and she, and, and she says, hey, I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. What are you doing here? Why are you asking me? And he said, if you knew who I was, the son of God, Right, Jesus, God in the flesh. If you knew who I was, I want you, you would be asking me for water and I would give you living water. And living water, as we're going to see here in the next verses, is everlasting. It's it's the Holy Spirit. It's 
It's the eternal life. It's it's more than just some H2O, right? But I, I believe that's what it means. Verse 11, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his living his uh his livestock Jesus answered everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again h2o they're going to be thirsty again but whoever drinks the water i give them will never thirst indeed the water i give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life Ooh, let's let's read that again. That's some fire. That's some Jesus dropping some bombs. All right, he's dropping that fire. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. So you drink that H2O, you're going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks this water, I give them will never thirst. You will never thirst again once you drink this water. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So what I what I believe this verse is speaking is is a metaphor for the water is the world H2O, right? You drink you drink eat that bread, you drink that water, you get that money, you get that status, you get whatever from the world, you're going to want more of it. You're just going to want more money, more status, more power, more fame, more water, more food. You're just going to want more and more and more because it's not never enough. You're going to continue to be thirsty. But if you drink from the water that Jesus gives, which is the Holy Spirit, which is accepting him as your Lord and Savior, which is the Bible, which is God himself, you will never be you will never thirst for the world again because you're fulfilled in the soul. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water well welling up to eternal life so what i think is like when you when you get get this holy spirit when you accept jesus christ your lord and savior when you're following the word and you're you're building your relationship with god right um what that means is what that means is the fact that um you're going to you're going to um never want to thirst for anything else ever again right because and you're going to be pouring out to other people like you see me guys me doing right you're going to be pouring life into other people right when you when you're filled with this when you're filled with this right um do you guys have any do you guys have any thoughts on that i'm gonna take somebody real quick do you guys have any thoughts on that You guys have any thoughts? Cool. All right. Um, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't uh, get thirsty and have to keep coming here in the water. All right. Cool. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Welcome, Timo. All right, we're getting into it. Um, all right, so I'll read. We're in verse 13, John 13. All right, um, I'll reread that and re-explain where we're picking up. So Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will not be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life, right? So what I was saying right there, again, this is John 4, verse 13, 13 through 14, is when you drink the living water, that's why I named this Bible study living water, is that you're never going, you're not going to be thirsty for water again, right? You're not going to be thirsty for the world. You're not going to be thirsty for money or women or status or power or any of that stuff because you're drinking the living water and you're so you're never going to be thirsting for the world again because this water is eternal life. 
Okay, so verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't go get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Verse 16, he told her, go call your husband and come back. So he's prophesizing, right? Because he doesn't know that she has a husband, right? He just met this, this lady at the well and he's all like, hey, go get your husband then. Um, verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. Verse 18, the fact is you have five husbands and the, the man you now have is not your husband. What do you, uh, what you have just said is quite true. Now, I always think this, uh, when Jesus says this is quite funny because he's like calling her out. He's all like, you know, he's, he's all like, yeah, you're right. You don't got a husband. You got five. Like, and that to a woman, right? That's that's uh, calling her out pretty hard. It's like you don't got one, you don't got one husband. You got five, and you don't even you're not even the man you're living with right now. He isn't your husband either. So he's prophesizing, showing, um, and she's like, "Sir," verse nineteen, John four verse nineteen. Sir, the woman said, "I can see that you are a prophet." Twenty. Our ancestors worship on the mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where you we must worship is in Jerusalem. Verse 21, woman, woman, Jesus said, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the father neither on the mountain nor in Jer Jerusalem. Verse 22, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet 23, verse 23, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the father seeks. Verse 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in the truth. So I think the, the main thing that sticks out to me there in that verse is... Uh, um, well, really breaking the legalism within the time, because within, within the time this is written in the context is with the Pharisees and the Jews, it's very legalism, meaning there's only a specific type of way to worship God. You have to worship God in a specific building in a specific country you have to do in Jerusalem. You have to, you know, you have to do in a specific way. And when he, when he's talking about, um, here you there yet there is a time coming now when the true worshipers will worship the father in the spirit and in truth for they are the kind of worship worshipers the father seeks verse 24 god is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth right which is prophesizing the holy spirit right uh that that god talks about all over uh, or that what jesus talks about all throughout the bible um, is the Holy Spirit. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth, which Jesus calls the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that the that Messiah called Jesus is coming when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Verse 26, then just Jesus declared, I, the one you are speaking to, I am he, right? So he's, she's talking about, hey, this guy, the Messiah, Jesus is coming to tell us all about all this stuff. And he's like, you're looking at him. I am he that you were talking about. All right. The disciples rejoined Jesus, verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him uh, talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Verse 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I never did. Could this be the Messiah? Verse 30, they came out of town and made their way toward him. 31, meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Verse 32, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Right? And I think what he's speaking about there is, hey, I got something much better than food. I'm already full, full of the spirit. Like, I don't need, I don't need no bread. I got, I got the real bread. Um, verse 33, then his disciples said to him, each other, could someone have brought him food? Verse 34, my food, Jesus said, is, is to do the will of whom uh, for him who sent me and to finish his work. 
35, don't you have a saying? It is still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. 36, even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Verse 37, thus the same one sows and another reaps is true. Verse 38, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the, the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. All right. And so this, this I believe, is prophesizing the whole aspect of salvation through Jesus. Um, when he's talking about, um, because the concept of, of being fed, right, is the do the will of who the one, okay, he says, it takes four months to harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. So I live by a whole bunch of farms. So look at the fields. You're going to see a whole bunch of food. They are ripe for harvest. 36, even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life. So speaking of the time that this, this is written with the Jews and the Jesus and everything is you have to work to get salvation, right? The, back then you had to make sacrifices. You literally had to, you had to do all these different things if you wanted to go to heaven. That's what what it says. Um, so that the so, uh, even now you have to work with your wages to get the crops of eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus, the saying, "The one that sows and the, another reaps," is true. Verse thirty eight: I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. So I sent you to reap what you have not worked for, which is the concept of salvation. Um, others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor, right? So I believe that's what Jesus is saying right there um, when it comes to what he's about to do in the book of John, um, later on in the book of John. Uh, many Samaritans believed. Many of the Samaritans from this town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to say, uh, to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of the of the, his words, many be, uh, became believers. Now they said to the woman, "We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Jesus heals an uh, official's son. After two days, he left Ga for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet ha uh, has no honor in his own country." When you arrive in Galilee, the uh, Gentiles welcome him. They have seen all of that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they have also been there. Verse 46, once more he visited Cana in the Galilee. Somebody's trying to join. Uh, once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turn, uh, tuned the water into wine. There was a central rule official whose son laid uh, sick at uh, Capertunum. I don't think I pronounced that right. Um, verse 47, when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. 40, 48. Now this verse gives me a lot of um, context when um, Jesus talks about this. And this is with a lot of people who uh, don't believe and also with current believers. Verse 48, Jesus says, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told them you will never believe. And I think that verse very hits home is because a lot of people won't believe in God or won't believe Jesus is God until they see signs and wonders, right? You won't believe I'm God until you see me bring this dead kid back to life or until I heal the sick or heal the blind or walk on water or turn water into wine. You will, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told them you will never believe. Verse 49, the royal official said, sir, come down before the uh, for, before my child die, dies. Verse 50, go. Jesus replied, your son will live. Right? So what really hits home now is this guy is coming up to Jesus saying, hey, hey, you need to save my son. You need to save my son. He's going to die. And Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonder, wonders, you will never believe I, you know, uh, believe in me. And then uh, he said, sir. Come now before my child dies. And Jesus just says, go, and your son will live, right? He, didn't, he doesn't do anything. He, I think he's probably miles away from his son. He just says, go, and your son will live. 
The man took Jesus at his word and uh, departed. While he was still on his way, his servants met him with the, the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as uh, to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after perform, uh, coming from Judah to Galilee. All right, so this is the, the major one. If we're looking at this, John chapter four, I call it living water because of the concept of a, the Holy Spirit believing in eternal life, that that, that is the water, that is the, that's what's going to fill you, that fills your soul. You don't need anything in this world when you have that. That is the water that you will never need again, that you don't need to thirst for. You have it. And so you no longer thirst for the world as you did before, right? But when you're still living in the world, you thirst for money, success, women, whatever, uh, whatever, because you're treating that as it, it is God and to fill your soul, right? But when you have, when you're drinking the living water of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you are quenched of all thirst, right? But the miracle Jesus uh, does in cha John chapter four is when he says, when the kid, when he, the, one, the guy comes up to him and says, hey, my son's going to die, save my son. And Jesus, all Jesus does, he doesn't touch the kid. He doesn't lay hands. He doesn't go pray over him. He just says, go. And Jesus, Jesus said, go, your son will live. That's all he said. So it was just like, just how he turned water into wine, snap of a finger. He just said, go, your son's going to live. And the guy goes and finds out his son lives, right? Which is pretty cool. All right, that's uh, John chapter four. Um, again, the reason I called, uh, I know Ash just joined. The reason I called it uh, living water is uh, verse John 4, verse 13 through 14, when he says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. He's talking about H2O, right? But I think it's a metaphor for everything in life, right? But he says, anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Verse 14, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So, if you get the Holy Spirit, you believe in Jesus, your, your, your cup is filled. You're no longer thirsty for everything in the world, so much so that you become a spring of water of well-being. And I think that's you pouring into other people, right? That, that you're so abundant with the Holy Spirit that you pour into other people. You're no longer thirsting for money or women or success or power, or whatever it is, drugs, whatever you were before, but you're filled and you're filled. You don't need that stuff anymore. You're not thirsty for that stuff. You're filled. And so much so that you pour into other people. All right. So that's why I call this uh, Bible study living water. Um, I think the, the application of this is a God's warrior is realizing through the Holy Spirit, you are the, the all you need is God. You need God's word, which is God speaking to you. And then you need prayer relationship with God. And you, you are filled. You are, you are, your, your, your thirst is quenched right? You are filled. And so much so, the more you build your relationship with God, you fill with the Holy Spirit, you pour into other people. You just pour and pour into other people because you're a spring of, of water welling up to eternal life. Think about that. You're, you're like a, man, that's, that's probably the, that's the biggest spring in the whole world, right? So I think that's the main takeaway is that continue to get filled up through the Holy Spirit, fill yourself up with your relationship with God and pour into other people, right? Um, so much so, right? And if you really think about that, I think about that with my personal self is um, before, like the more I get to God, the more I just want to pour into other people, the less I care about myself and the more I just want to serve other people and pour into other people, right? The farther I'm away from God or before I came to Jesus, I didn't, I just cared about myself. All I cared about was me, right? And I didn't care about pouring into other people. If I wanted to help people, it was for my benefit financially or whatever it was my benefit right but now like I, I i just i just am so filled my quenches thirst that all i want to do is pour into other people right but cool guys uh that's john chapter four living water you got daniel ash you guys have anybody have any questions or any comments right Yeah, something, Brian.
Oh no, my bad. Ash, you look like you're thinking in depth, bro. You got just got to work it out. No, yeah, I just took a shower. My bad, I forgot like about the meeting. That's why I was a little late. Cool, buddy. From what from what you heard, do you have any 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 thoughts? Any takeaways? Um, yeah, I think uh, that's like interesting how you know he says that like you know like I I think he was uh, combining like the carnal like we get thirsty mm-hmm. and um but you know if we drink from his water we're fulfilled mm-hmm. so uh so i think i don't i don't know if this is accurate but like i i feel like you know people they're always like craving something they're always like missing something but you know he's kind of like the thing that we need and if we draw from him like we won't be like craving something mm-hmm yeah, that's why I see it time and time again, because I uh, when I look at worldly people or when I look at just a majority of people that aren't really close to God is they're 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 seeking things in the world, whatever it may be, to fill their soul. Because I know that was me. I was seeking for everything to fill the void inside my soul. I was looking to f- f- fulfilled by helping as many people as possible, money, women, drugs, uh, power, status, just everything. And And the thing is, is you get, you help, let's say a hundred people or you, you, whatever it is, you get it. It's just like a drug addict. You realize that doesn't fulfill you and you need more. Like you get some money. So oh, I need more money then. Like this isn't, this isn't fulfilling me. So I need more money. I, I'm helping this many people. It's not fulfilling me. I need to help more people. The questions, the answer is always more just like a drug addict doing some Coke. Right. It's like, Oh, this isn't, I'm not high. I need more. Right. It's the same thing. Like you're because you're looking for worldly things to fill your soul when only God can do that. And the more I pursue God, right. The more that I'm for like, it actually fills, right. People are trying to fill, you know, the, the, the God emptiness in their, in their soul and their hearts with worldly things. And it never, it never fills them up. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's why I think that the living water, that's what it is. The Holy Spirit, right, which is the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead, right? The spirit that he he continues to talk about that in the book of John, that he's going to give us his spirit, right? Which is a which is a very, a very hard concept to understand, right? But it's like that that spirit lives within you, and that's what fulfills you. That's what fills up your cup. So much so that the more that you have that spirit, the more that you want to give it to others that you want to pour into others. It overflows, like he said, like a spring that rises up to eternal life, right? Which if I didn't have that, I want to be on this call, right? I wouldn't want to pour into anybody else, right? But it's it's called the good news for a reason. If it's good news, you should share it. That's another challenge is that God's warriors is if you truly believe it's a good news, if you truly believe in it, you should want to share it, right? Like if you if you just heard the dopest album of your entire life, you remember when you're in high school and you just want to share with all your friends or you talk about a basketball game or whatever you share with all your friends. This is supposed, this is supposed to be literally a million times better than that. And people aren't sharing it. Right. Like that's why it's, it's called the good news. So it's a reflection of, you know, it says, it says in the Bible, I have not given you a spirit of fear, right? So God doesn't give a spirit of fear. So you shouldn't be afraid. You should be bold and courageous to share the gospel. That's what it says. So, you know, it's the good news. And so that's what I, what I've been doing, you know, but cool guys, any, any last minute comments or questions or anything like that? Well, I got this one, this one, uh, event that happened to me with God. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like inside my house and like the, the curtains were open in my window, my front window. And like it was at nighttime and like, so maybe this car just came up from the road and like it came like a mighty wind. Like I don't know how to explain it. Like it looks like I have faith in, in that person who just passed by and there was no cars around. It was just that one car. And like I suddenly my hands just, just raised up and like God made me raise my hand up and like, to perform a miracle to that person. Like was able to like like that miracle was able to make that person like 
the uh, part the Red Sea like Moses, and like it, it was like the promised child too. Like it's like God made that person be born before me, and like to meet me at the right time at the right place, and like she she looked like she was in her thirties, but. It looked like God knew me before I was born because he was in the 30s and it looked like he was a promised child and also myself. And like she made, God made it the right time when we see each other in person and like perform a miracle as well. Like, like Moses did, like find the rest feet. It was something like, something like, out of the ordinary. Yeah. I'm not, I don't know how to say it. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the, in the original book, the Bible was written as Hebrews and there is no translation for a coincidence, right? So that in the original context of the Bible was written, there is no word for coincidence. Coincidence is a man-made creative word. It's not a, you know, it's what we've created since then. So I truly don't believe in any coincidences at all, which regardless is is i think is a way better way to view the world that everything happens for a reason right everything specifically happens for a reason so um yeah thanks for sharing bro cool anything else guys all right guys well i'll see you next week we're gonna be moving it to i think wednesdays at uh 5 5 p.m uh pacific standard time 8 p.m eastern time consistently on wednesdays so uh, if you guys want to be here next wednesday um, i'll see you guys there other than that continue the the serve god and be you know a warrior against satan and demons and the the devil right and do god's will serve others and, and be a warrior for god all right guys much love god bless you guys i'll see you guys next week Bye. peace be with you god bless